Now, the third two-party system that developed during and especially after the Civil War was really characterized by relatively weak presidents, almost all of them Republican Civil War veterans, and a relatively strong Congress, typically dominated by a slim margin uh, by the Democrats, especially in the House of Representatives. And it was largely an inactive government. The main difference, for practical purposes, between the two political parties being whether they favored a high or protective tariff, as the Republicans did, or a low tariff, um, a revenue tariff, which the Democrats wanted, called a revenue tariff, because it was meant to raise just enough revenue um, for the U.S. government to cover its basic expenses. Um, an army to kill Indians, a task largely completed by 1890, a navy to defend us from pirates. Um, although there was a growing view that a navy could serve other purposes too, and of course the post office to deliver the mail. However, there were those um, by the late 1800s who were becoming unhappy, um, unhappy with this, and this would lead to a dissolution, or at least a big change from a third two-party system to a fourth. Um, not dissolution, I suppose, but diversification. As many, um, many Americans became unhappy with the economic circumstances in the country. Um, many farmers wanted debt relief. Um, both Republican and Democratic farmers um, wanted relief from the deflation they were experiencing in the late 1800s. Furthermore, Many urban and rural people were unhappy with the big businesses of the day. Um, farmers were unhappy with the big banks that charged them high interest rates, um, and especially with the railroad cartels that fixed prices, um, which uh, ate up most of, of the income that farmers got when they had to ship their produce um, on the railroads. They needed the railroads, but they hated them. The urban middle class um, which was growing in numbers and wealth and power, also resented the monopolies, which kept prices high, quality low, and also shut out ambitious businessmen from rising and creating successful companies of their own, as had been possible for, say, Carnegie or Rockefeller um, a decade or so before. And so there was a growing demand for reform, um, both among the urban middle class who tended to be Republican, um, and rural people were, who were often Democratic uh, in the South and the Midwest, often Republican in the Great Plains, and sometimes in the Midwest. There was also a growing faith in the power of expertise, uh, of professionals. There was a growing professionalization of many jobs. Um, and the uh, there was a belief that Experts uh, in their fields could use the power of the government to bring about reform, to bring about progress. And so those reformers came to be known as progressives. As progressives with a lowercase p, it was not a co cohesive um, political movement. Um, you could find progressives among the Republicans and progressives among the Democrats, likewise conservatives and moderates in both parties. And that would become one of the distinguishing features of the fourth two-party system, which is that it was less about Republicans competing with Democrats, all they certainly did, as it was about progressives um, within each party, sometimes working with progressives in the other party, um, to try to bring about positive change, or conservatives uh, in each party working with conservatives in the other to try to limit changes to maintain things as they were. And some politicians might be progressive in some ways and conservative in others. There was much more variety within the parties and even um, for individuals than, than seems common today. So the compromise was perhaps easier then than it is now, although certainly, um, certainly not always possible. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would argue that the Gilded Age, as the late 1800s are also referred to, really continued all the way to the Great Depression, that dividing, say, a third and a fourth two-party system 
um, is artificial or arbitrary. But I really think there are some pretty significant differences and a pretty clear, um, a pretty clear uh, point of division, which is the assassination of President William McKinley in the summer of 18, sorry, 1901 um, as replacement by his young vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, who I've discussed at length in earlier episodes in this series. And he was uh, a progressive reformer. And if he and most progressives at the time would look to the modern movement, who have come to call themselves progressives in the past decade or so, I think in some ways they'd be pretty pleased with their accomplishments and agree with some of their goals. In other ways, I think they'd be shocked and even horrified by some of the things that they stand for. Um, although that, too, would vary from progressive to progressive um, of a century ago, looking at the progressives of today, as it was a very diverse um, movement at the time. Um, in the th fourth two-party system, which I think we can say lasts from about 1901 to 1933, um, you have Republicans and you have Democrats, but Again, the big, big competition is really between the progressive wing of each party and the conservative wing of each party. And in the first two decades of this period, the progressives were clearly dominant um, at the presidential level and often at the uh, congressional and state level as well. The presidential level mattered because we'd see a series of strong presidents, Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson in particular would do a great deal to push their ideas on the American people. Theodore Roosevelt described the presidency as a bully pulpit. Bully um, in the sense of excellent, outstanding. Um, he used the term, as people today would say, fool, um, or whatever young people say today, Lord knows. Um, the presidency was a bully pulpit, an excellent place from which to preach to the American people the gospel of progressive reform. Woodrow Wilson took very much the same idea. Even William Howard Taft, who came between the two, um, despite his reputation for being moderate or even conservative, actually supported many progressive views. Um, and so progressives in this time, um, for the most part, accepted the gold standard um, because um, major gold strikes in the late 1890s had put enough gold into circulation to create moderate inflation and largely eliminate the need for free silver, um, or at least reduce the pressure for it. Um, the uh, progressives uh, adopted the working class goal of a shorter working day, which at least for federal employees and interstate railroad workers um, was accomplished by the 19 teens. After reading the work of muckrakers, um, investigative journalists um, such as Ida Tarbell, um, Lincoln Steffens, David Graham Phillips, probably most famously um, Upton Sinclair, whose novel The Jungle exposed the horrors of the meatpacking industry, uh, of men ground up in the sausage makers, buttons going out to the public's breakfast and their meat, um, and widows being told their husbands uh, had run off and abandoned them. Not that they'd been ground up into, uh, into sausages. Um, led almost immediately to the passage of the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. Many other safety regulations were created um, at the national level, at the state and local levels as well. Um, workplace safety laws to some extent, um, building safety laws, even some early anti-pollution laws in which some cities required people who burned coal for heat to burn anthracite coal, which is a cleaner burning coal than bituminous coal. Um, Presidents Roosevelt and Taft and Wilson sometimes took the side of labor, or at least required a more or less equitable um, agreement between the working class and the bosses, uh, even creating departments of commerce and labor to try to deal with uh, the growing labor and business issues of the day. The progressives sought child labor laws, which were created but soon overturned by the Supreme Court. Many progressives wanted temperance. Many of them were Protestant reformers, 
and this they had the support of many rural voters as well, uh, many progressives being kind of urban middle class people. But many rural people, Republican and Democratic, supported temperance, believing in the spirit of the Second Great Awakening of the early 1800s um, that, alco that alcohol itself was sinful, or at least led to sinful activity. Um, also, the urban middle class, who often were progressives, um, did not want their workers showing up drunk, a drunk worker being a bad worker. Um, and many working class leaders, at least, supported temperance, feeling that the, uh, that the saloons preyed upon the income of the working class. Temperance was also a woman's issue. It being felt that a drunk husband was a bad husband, possibly being abusive, possibly being absent, um, possibly getting injured or killed uh, at work or in a bar fight or elsewhere, um, either wasting the family's money on alcohol or being unable to earn money at all because it can be hard for a drunk to hold down a job. Um, women were involved in many parts of the progressive movement in pushing for child labor laws, workplace safety laws, consumer safety laws. Um, Middle-class women were increasingly educated and um, course, had plenty of money and plenty of free time, aside from supervising the servants, to take leading roles in many aspects of the progressive movement. And so many progressives, although not all, supported women's suffrage, the right to vote, which had first been given to women in the territory of Wyoming in 1869, but which had only been granted in four western states in total by the beginning of the 20th century. But by 1920, Women had gained the right to vote in state after state after state, and finally nationwide through the um, 19th Amendment, um, which was ratified in 1920, the state of Tennessee being the decisive 36th state to give women the right to vote, um, known sometimes as the perfect 36, for being both the 36th state um, needed to ratify the amendment um, and also, say, 36-inch bust was viewed as the perfect bust size. So in some ways, it was a boob joke for 1920. Likewise, the temperance movement had been successful the year before with the 18th Amendment, creating nationwide prohibition. Um, earlier in the decade, the 16th Amendment had created the income tax, which um, we may not appreciate much today, but progressives who wanted the government to be more active needed a way to pay for it. In those days, most politicians still believed that if we were going to spend money, we needed to find it first. Um, and so the income tax was created um, with a top rate of, I believe, 7%, which uh, I was once told um, hit a tax bracket encompassing John Jacob Astor IV. Although I believe that was not actually true, if I'm not mistaken, he had died in the Titanic shortly before the income tax was created. But if the income tax affected a very small portion of the population. And even those people were not hit very hard by the standards of, of later income taxes. The uh, progressives also brought about the direct election of senators, um, believing that would make the Senate more responsive to the people um, and harder to bribe as they had to be chosen by a statewide electorate. Uh, in contrast to the past, in which state legislatures chose senators. It being felt originally the House of Representatives represented the people, but the Senate in some ways represented the states uh, in their own right. The, uh, yeah, there were, the progressives, um, in some ways, though, did try to limit participation in democracy. Um, it being felt that some people lacked the wisdom um, to vote wisely. And so um, voter restrictions were supported in some places. Um, voter registration um, became more stringent, partly to reduce the power of corrupt political bosses. But it's true in the South, it also made it much harder for African Americans to vote, um, as Southern Democrats wanted to maintain their power by making sure African Americans did not vote for the party of Lincoln in parts of the North and the Far West. Um, literacy tests were used to keep immigrants from voting, um, as many were either poorly educated, period, or um, at least not particularly literate in English. 
Likewise, the power of elected mayors was often reduced, and the power of city commissions, meant to be staffed by experts, was increased. In turn, city commissions would often hire a city um, um, a city manager, pardon me, um, to run the day-to-day -day affairs of the city, but not an elected official, but someone who perhaps studied civil engineering um, or city management or urban planning in college to be an expert in that field. But uh, Americans eventually tired of all these progressive reforms, all these radical changes, particularly after Woodrow Wilson, um, only the second Democrat elected president since the Civil War, um, tried to apply this notion of the government creating moral reform, not just domestically, but abroad as well. His diplomacy sometimes has been described as moral diplomacy. All to be fair, um, Theodore Roosevelt before him had practiced big stick diplomacy, um, sometimes describing America as Latin America's policemen, protecting them not just from outsiders, as America had long promised, but protecting them from themselves. Um, Woodrow Wilson became involved in a civil war in Mexico, um, sending in the Marines and eventually 10,000 soldiers of the U.S. Army to, as he put it, teach the South American republics to elect good men. And ultimately, Woodrow Wilson would ask Congress for a declaration of war against Germany in 1917 um, to uh, make the world safe for democracy to fight a war to end all wars. And to be sure, there had many, been many provocations against America. German unrestricted submarine warfare had sunk our ships, interfered with our freedom of the seas. Although to be fair, Britain's blockade of Germany had also interfered with our freedom of the seas. But it's different when, they're, when they do it, because they speak English, so they're okay. Mm. And there had certainly been other um, provocations to Germany's Zimmerman note, Zimmerman telegram to Mexico, encouraging Mexico to attack the United States, which Mexico fortunately chose not to do in 1917. But the First World War uh, was incredibly expensive. The U.S. government and progressives within the government saw as a chance to bring about even more reform as the government um, took over much of the economy, uh, increasing the power of experts. Um, to manage the economy and society, taking over the railroads, um, taking over much of industry, promoting voluntary um, food restrictions, um, expanding the income tax, uh, and much more. Uh, even, uh, even prohibition was partly a patriotic action, saving grain for our soldiers. And of course, um, beer is such a very German, very German beverage. It was almost unpatriotic to drink it. But after this, Americans were exhausted by two decades of progressive reform, um, by moral diplomacy overseas, and Wilson's attempt to join the League of Nations was blocked by the United States Senate. And in the 1920s, Americans chose, at least at the presidential level, to return to normalcy. Um, having for 20 years, had presidents from the progressive wings of their party. Uh, Americans now chose presidents from the conservative wing of the Republican Party, the Democratic Party being split between fairly conservative rural Democrats and, in some ways, more liberal urban Democrats, and, um, particularly the issue of prohibition splitting the Democrats with rural Democrats supporting it and urban Democrats often opposing prohibition, particularly um, Catholic and immigrant Democrats or descendants of recent immigrants. Immigration itself, though, was almost completely ended um, in the early 1920s, um, particularly immigration from areas outside Western Europe. But even that immigration was, was limited and discouraged. Um, in 1920, Americans elected Warren G. Harding, who promised a return to normalcy. War planes were burned in public bonfires to show we would never need them again. 
and America to some extent withdrew from world affairs, although Harding did oversee the Washington Naval Conference, an international conference to reduce the size of the great powers' navies, um, to reduce the chance of a future war, and also to save money um, by not continuing a naval arms race that had been going on since the late 1800s. Um, under Harding, um, and following his death, um, President Coolidge, who famously said, the business of America is business. The man who builds a factory builds a temple, and the man who works there worships there. And then under the, uh, the great mining engineer and businessman, Herbert Hoover, uh, known as the great humanitarian, for his support um, of starving Europeans during and after World War I, the um, U.S. government, at least at the presidential level, returned to a more traditional style of government, a more limited government with lower taxes, um, aside from the tariff, which was raised repeatedly through the 1920s, and then, um, most famously with the Hawley Smoot Tariff in 1930, um, hoping that a very protective tariff, one of the three highest in our history, would help us during the Great Depression which most modern economists now uh, feel actually had the reverse effect. Um, that said, at the state level, progressives were still often influential. In Tennessee, for example, Governor Austin Peay um, paved roads throughout the states, the state, and modernized the, uh, the state in many ways, although did also reluctantly support the Butler Act, um, which banned the teaching of human evolution in the state of Tennessee. Um, not so much because he supported the law himself, but he wanted to win the votes um, of farmers who were unhappy with all the money being spent paving roads, which they saw as useful only for city people who owned cars. Um, and at the presidential level, the uh, progressives were less successful, um, fighting Bob La Follette, um, former governor of Wisconsin, tried to get the Republican nomination in 1924 and then ran as a progressive um, candidate in that year, failing, just as Theodore Roosevelt had run as a third-party progressive candidate in 1912 uh, and also failed. Um, but by... Uh, by the early 1930s, the Depression had hit the United States. Um, and while President Herbert Hoover ultimately supported um, what seemed like some pretty big spending government programs to try to bring the U.S. out of the Depression, um, it wasn't seen as enough. And the United States in 1932 will elect a Democrat, um, only the third Democrat elected since the Civil War, Franklin Roosevelt, um, who promised Americans a new deal to solve the problems of the Depression, while being very vague about what the new deal was, aside from criticizing Herbert Hoover for spending so much money and expanding the power of the government. Um, and Roosevelt's new deal would reshape American politics again um, as he formed the New Deal Coalition retaining um, influence over all the traditionally Democratic groups, um, while also attracting um, new groups who in the past had been largely Republican. Um, and uh, creating a fifth two-party system that would persist, uh, would persist for at least 20 years, arguably for 30 or 40, um, possibly um, as much as 60 years um, after his election. 